Hey, this is John at The Bible Project. This summer, we've been releasing a series that was originally aired on our YouTube channel on a live stream. We've gotten requests to take that audio and put it on a podcast, so we're doing just that. In this episode, Tim and I host a Q&R, a question and response, on the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers is a wild ride in the Old Testament. It documents Israel's journey through the wilderness after they were rescued from Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land if they could just get their act together. Tim and I discuss questions about the bronze snake, the pagan sorcerer Balaam, and the difference in the Old Testament between being sinful and being unclean. Thanks for joining us. Here we go. So this is just the book of numbers. Five sections. Five sections overall. Yeah the, yeah, the book's one big journey. Um, and it's uh, there are three collections of stories, one around Mount Sinai at first, right where they're, yeah, Israel's ending their one year stay. They've been here for a year. A year. In a desert, yep. under a mountain, yeah. hanging out, yep. getting lost. Yep. That's a long backpacking trip. It is. It's a long <laughs> camping trip. They get organized, you know, they get the, the camps, the ordering of the camps, it's all cool, they take a census. If I was there for a year at that point, I'd probably be like, you know what? This might just be home. Yeah. We might just be chilling here for the rest of my yeah, life. Yeah, it's a pretty desolate part of the world. You'd be anxious to get out of there. Yeah, it's not a great place to stay. So Numbers actually means in the wilderness. That's right. The Book of Numbers is its uh, uh, Greek name, and it refers to the two census. Is it censuses? Sensi? <laughs> I don't censuses. know. Censuses. Uh, there's one at the beginning, and there's one near the end of the book. Uh, the, the Hebrew name, which is much older, is Bamidbar in the, in the wilderness. So they begin in the wilderness, they end in the wilderness, and the book has two travel sections that frame the center, which is a bunch of tragic stories that also take place in the wilderness. Right here. Yep. So okay, different places of the wilderness, yeah. but it's all on this long so they, journey. So there's like five sections. Yep. They're in Sinai, and then they travel for a yep. while. There's stories while they travel. Then they're yep. in Paran, yep. and that's where the spy thing happens and stuff. Yep. Yep. And that's somewhere in the wilderness there. Yep. And then they travel again, yep. and then they get to the plains of Moab, which is right before they get to yes. the Jordan that, River. That's right. So that's the structure of the book. Mm -hmm. Lots of Really, really interesting stories in here, which we'll jump into with questions, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Let's do that. So there was a bunch of questions about a story that takes place right here after uh, the second travel narrative. The scene shifts to a strange set of stories um, about a guy named Balaam and then the king of Moab, Balak. And uh, Balak hires Balaam as a sorcerer to pronounce uh, curses on the nation of Israel because, like Pharaoh, he's freaked out that this large people group Yeah, so this large group of people land. are coming through. Yeah. You and know, you think, you're, like, yeah. they want my land. Yeah. They, they weren't after his land, but what does he yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And so he hires this dude yes. to try to take him down. Yeah. So strategy one might be, like, let's go just fight him. But a better thing to do is hire some dude hire a, so God will just curse him. That's right. Hire so he's just like a guy for hire. He is. And actually, here's what's interesting. You guys, um, Google, well, I'll have to spell it. Um, in the late 60s, in the modern country of Jordan, uh, they were doing, I think it was something like a building was getting torn down or something. Uh, but they discovered this ancient set of structures that went back to the uh, Israelite time period, and they found these texts that are called the Deir Allah texts, so D-E-I-R, Deir, and then Allah texts. D-E-I-R-A-L-L-A-H. -L 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 -L. Uh, Two mm -hmm. And then if you Google Deir Allah and Balaam, you'll get it. And what they discovered these um, ancient texts that mention Balaam. It's actually a, uh, a record of him prophesying in the name of God Most High. And uh, it, anyway, so, so what, what these texts showed us is that Balaam was a well-known sorcerer in mm. the ancient world. Oh, wow. And the Israelites weren't the only people who knew about him. Uh, in their texts. This guy, yeah, Nostradamus. this guy was a legend. Yeah, so kind of like the way Nostradamus is, you know, kind of a well-known as a yeah. 
pre you know, pre predictive. So kind of so predictive you'd be divider. like, oh, Balaam, I know about that guy. Yeah. They got that guy? Yeah, totally. Oh, geez. Yeah, so when we read about Balaam, we should all be going like, oh, this Balaam. is not, not Balaam's good. coming. Yeah, all Balaam. Right. And I like how we drew him here. Here, I'll, I'll show. Yeah, I'll, like the tribal, zoom in on him. Tribal chief. If you go to my screen again, he's not. If you Google image search Balaam, you get like little like chubby guys on donkeys that are, <laughs> they just look cute. Yeah. And you're like, oh, that guy. Yeah. Balaam's so cute, and his donkey talked to him. Yes. But like this guy, he like curses people for a living. Yes. He's probably pretty gnarly. Yes, he is. So. So, um, right. they, we have a handful of questions about Balaam. So I just kind of want to hit them because they raise different questions about Balaam. So one is Aurelia D, who you always ask, perceptive, very good questions. Aurelia, you're down yonder here, and uh, you ask the question here. Um, it seems like Balaam has a relationship with or an understanding of the God of Israel, but is this possible for a pagan sorcerer? That's a really good question. Apparently. Somehow he has word of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like almost every story that's in the Torah, um, there are questions that we come with or questions that the story raises that it doesn't attempt to answer. And that's one of them, uh, is how does this uh, pagan ancient sorcerer actually connect to the God of Israel and the God of Israel reveals things to him. And I, I think from the Israelite author's point of view, it's a way of saying, yeah, God isn't just, the God of Israel isn't just a tribal God. Yeah. It's the creator of, he's the creator of all. And so he can reveal himself to anybody. And the, he, he does so to Balaam. So maybe he got word somehow, or maybe God told him somehow. Yeah. Like we can conjecture. But we're not talking about like, he, he doesn't live in some so crazy far away place. If yeah. you were just going to hike to Moab yeah, sure. from Sinai, yes. let's say, sure. it probably should just take a week, right, on foot. Yes, but what's interesting, the Israelites haven't been in the land, just the patriarchs wandering around. Yeah. So the question is, how does he even know about Yahweh, the God of Israel? The story well, someone, begs that Let's question. just say someone who was at Mount Sinai takes off, right? <laughs> And goes, I'm just going to go explore by myself. Sure. And, like, yeah. and he starts telling the stories. I mean, yeah. whatever. Well, we, we, we do know when the Israelites get to um, Jericho, Rahab Already knows. is in the city. And she, has, she says, all the Canaanites, we've Word heard spreads. about what your God did for you. Yeah. And so the God of Israel's reputation was spreading. We know that. But this is more. This is a pagan sorcerer who can... Yeah. Do powerful things. Or, you know, his words have power and he connects them to the God of Israel. So I'm just affirming it's bizarre. And I think the story assumes and knows that it's bizarre. That's why it's telling the story, is because it's remarkable. Hmm. And, and then, specifically, that God, even though this is a powerful sorcerer in the ancient world, actually he's just a servant of the God of Israel, and he can only say yeah. what the God of Israel wants. So take the most say. powerful sorcerer in the ancient world mm -hmm. and put him in the story, and what does he do? He has to do what the God, yes. Yahweh wants. That's right. And yeah. what Yahweh wants is to it's, hook these guys up even though they've been, yes. been yeah. rumbling through the wilderness the whole yeah. time. Yeah, up to this point, Israel, the nation, has been yeah, behaving like a, you know, a toddler. Yeah. Uh, on a t temper tantrum. I think I would and if I spent 40 years in a, <laughs> in a desert. <laughs> That's true. But despite <laughs> what they're doing, God wants to bless his people. So your question's a good one, uh, Aurelia. So Kick Puncher 3000, who we now know as Christy Short. Yeah, um, hiding behind that robotic name. You put the question this way, similar type of question, but you ask, God told Balaam not to curse the Israelites. Does this mean that Balaam really had the power to bless or curse those whom he wished? If so, how? So the, the story about Balaam, again, assumes that he's a powerful sorcerer who the story turns out to show us is really n not powerful compared to Yahweh, the God of Israel. So did he really have power to curse from the perception of the Israelites? Totally. Yeah. And the, from the perception of Balaam, ab absolutely. Did he actually have these powers? Again, the story doesn't yeah. 
go give us most of the answers that we've but want. in but in that time period he was well known as a powerful and sorcerer. people would have totally been like yeah of course yeah yeah that's there why there would have been doubt about that that's right that's why the king of moab goes, goes gives him money him. yeah to yeah yeah right so it raises all other theological questions that we have right that the story Can people just, curse yeah tap into some power and yeah yeah which the story i think is saying no Everybody's subservient to the God of Israel, yeah. and their power is like nothing compared to compared to God's. Yeah, that's the point. And sweet, yeah, because Balaam. There's more puzzles about Balaam. Um, oh yeah, there was a first question, right? Um, Garen, Garen Forsyth. Uh, I don't think I've we've heard from Garen before. Oh, hi, Garen. Hey, man. Um, in the video, we talked about in the third Balaam speech. We talked about how Balaam predicted the king who will bless all nations. Uh, does Balaam talk about that blessing? Does talk about that coming king? There's only language about smashing the nations. Is there something in the Hebrew text that we don't see? Um, great question. The king of Moab hires him. He tries to, get it cursed, tries to get him to curse Israel three times. It doesn't work. And then Balaam, in... Uh, the fourth goes on with the fourth poem and then some others after that. Um, so in the second and third poems, in the second poem he mentions how God brought Israel as a nation up out of Egypt and is like, uh, he says, he is for is, God is for Israel like the horns of a wild ox. It's this cool metaphor. Hmm. But then in the, th uh, the third poem, he talks about, you'll see it here, it's in chapter 24, he talks about how a king and uh, an exalted kingdom is going to come out of Israel. And then he uses the same words he used about the nation in the third poem and applies them to the, this king in the, in the fourth poem about how God's going to bring this king on his own exodus and deliver this king out of Egypt. And God will be for this king like the horns of a wild ox. Hmm. And that this king will defeat all of his enemies and so on. And then at the very end of that poem, uh, there's a little, um, either it's Balaam talking or the author of the Pentateuch attaches a little post-it note, a little editorial post-it note, I think, where he quotes from poem of Judah's blessing at the end of the book of Genesis and attaches it here about this king being like a lion. And then after that, um, there's a quotation from God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. Mm -hmm. So I think the author of the Pentateuch is connecting this king that Balaam mentions to the king promised to come from the line of Judah in Genesis 49, connected to God's plan to bless all nations through Abraham's family in Genesis 12. And then there's another poem that goes on after that, his fourth poem, and he calls uh, this king the star that will come out of Jacob and a scepter coming out of Egypt. And he's going to be victorious um, over all of Israel's enemies and so on. What what's the purpose of the lion? That's from Genesis three or from I'm sorry, Genesis. That's the lion is Abel. from ja Jacob. is crouching at your door. Jacob's blessing of uh, oh. of the tribe of Judah oh, right, right, at the right. end of the book of Je uh, sorry, Genesis. What does that say? Yeah, right here. The people rise like a lioness. No, mm. it's it right. Mean? It's at the end of Numbers twenty four. This is Numbers twenty four nine. Yep. Like a lion, they crouch and lie down like a lioness who dares yep. rouse them. Okay. Yeah, it's a quotation. So it's a lion Judah. Yeah, 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 totally. Sweet. So I think, yeah, the author of the Pentateuch in these poems is connecting it to the whole Connecting story. us back up to the main themes. So here's of Balaam. The That's right. He hasn't been attached to this whole thing. He's heard mm -hmm. somehow, mm -hmm. and in his, what would you call it, prayer? His incantation? <laughs> yeah, his, his like, inc whatever it is, yes, yeah. he starts basically prophesying about this Messiah yeah. that we've learned about in very cryptic ways. Yes. The line of Judah. Yeah. The seed of the woman. The seed of the woman. Who's going to crush the snake. And, and then the three. promise to Abraham that yeah. through him all the world will be blessed. So in his incantation are all of these things. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, so cool that... It's, it's totally cool. Balaam is basically prophesying yeah. about Jesus. Yeah. From, from the king of Moab's point of view... He hired Balaam to curse his enemies. What Balaam ends up doing is pronouncing Moab's downfall <laughs> because of a king that will come forth from Israel. 
And then that king, the author, connects back to all of these key messianic promises from earlier in the book. Yeah. Yeah, it's, the, the poems of Balaam are absolutely crucial for understanding the message and main themes of the Torah. And they come from the most unlikely place. Yeah. Um, Which is, I guess, fairly typical. That's typical for the, how the Bible works. For the Torah as a whole. No, the Torah works. Yeah, most of the main characters are big screw ups, you know. Yeah. 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 Anyway, the Balaam stories. So thanks for your good questions about Balaam. They're odd stories, but they're super, super important. Cool. That's Balaam. Yeah. I spent a lot of time with Balaam. What other questions? Um, oh, man, there's here? lots of good questions. Um, ben Brown, you had a good question. I think uh, you've asked a question before. There is a story uh, here in Chapter 20. It's in the second wilderness section about um, the people grumbling. And then God sends snakes. It's the snake attack story. Yeah. It's very odd. Yeah. And so God tells Moses to make a bronze snake yep. on a pole. Okay. And, um, and Ben, you ask, uh, could you speak more about... Well, what's, the, what's the purpose of the bronze snake? Oh, well, the purpose is um, it's an image of the thing that's killing them. Yeah. And then this bro- idol snake statue, yeah. um, they look to it. And then, if they had been bit, that's right. They're going God to be fine. grants them he- healing and life. Yeah, yeah. It's very odd. Right. Very it's odd. Very if I went to church, and there was the guy with like a bronze snake, <laughs> and he's like, "Look at this, and you're going to be better." I'm going to be like, "I'm out of here." Yeah. That's just yeah. Weird. Oh, yeah. It's you, getting a little strange. It's super strange. It's but like what I, but story. in that time, there must be. I mean, yeah. what's that? What would what would I have been experiencing if I saw Moses doing this, and I'm an Israelite? I wouldn't have been like, "That's well, weird." Well, yes, but it's very well. Would have been weird. It's not a that. representation of God, because we they did that once on Mount Sinai with the golden calf thing, so, and that didn't go well for them. So it's clearly like God tells Moses, "Make a bronze symbolic representation of the animal that's out there biting." people. The symbol, the symbol is a paradox. It's a symbol of the thing that's, of his judgment. Yes. He's rendering his, you know, and it, when you pull the story out of context, you're like, oh, God's really a jerk here. But dude, just read the stories <laughs> leading up to it. God's been very patient with these people. So, so, so the snakes come as a form of his judgment. Okay. And then what God gives as a way of escape or a way to take refuge from his judgment is a symbol of the judgment itself. And so paradoxically, they look to the symbol of God's judgment, and that is the thing that's the vehicle of him granting them life again. The story is very strange. Very strange. But at the center of it is a symbol that at the same time is a symbol of God's judgment and of God's grace and life that he wants to give to his people. And, uh, you know, so Ben, you asked, could you speak more about God commanding Moses to create a bronze snake? Um, Why does God give Moses an idol for the people to look at? I have no idea. And neither does anybody else. This is just, the story is just there. Um, We do know that this snake statue stuck around in Israel Mm. um, because one of the later kings of Israel ends up digging it out of the... uh, Sto- archives, <laughs> yeah, the storage are, room. The archives, and then uh, a bunch of Israelites start to give offerings to it. Which um, wasn't this the is, point. No, definitely not the point. So, and then the last thing to tie it up, though, it's a, it is a strange story, um, but Jesus paid attention to the story when he read the book of Numbers. Uh-huh. In John chapter 3, where he starts talking about how he's going to die so that others can have life, This is in his conversation with Nicodemus. He brings up this story. And he says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so he says he will be lifted up so that others might have life. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus' being lifted up is all pointing forward to his being lifted up and nailed on the cross. So Jesus read the story, and he said, oh, that story's about me. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> or, yes, Jesus reads a story about a strange story, a strange way that God rescues his people, because the way that he rescues them mm. is itself a symbol of his judgment on them. Mm. Um, 
And that's precisely how uh, Jesus understood what was happening on the cross. Um, that God's judgment was coming, mm -hmm. that also in the same time was his, his, way, his way to save. That's everyone. right. Yeah, so think of it. It's a different image, but the same idea of the Last Supper. Uh, Passover. Mm -hmm. So he's putting himself in the place of this, yeah. of the blood of the Passover lamb, my yeah. body and my blood. So his death is going to become a source of life. So Jesus found this strange story of this bronze snake as a helpful image yeah. to unpack what his coming death was all about. And other prophets would have never done that kind of move, right? Like, mm. go, oh, actually, that story in the Torah, that was about me. Like, were there any other prophets saying that? Well, I mean, there were, there were definitely other people on the scene claiming that they were the Messianic, the Messiah. Messianic okay. king. Okay. Jesus is the only Jewish person we know of who ever see, mentions the story of the bronze snake as, as explaining something about themselves and what they're doing. Yeah, yeah it's very unique. This, but, uh, yeah, it just seems like he... The way he views all these scriptures and how he does that with Isaiah and different things, he's just like, yes, it's all about him, and in a way that people hadn't been thinking about. Yeah, so, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Jesus walks on into uh, a scene where people have lots of hopes and expectations. Many of them are based on the scriptures, um, but then Jesus also used a lot of things in the scriptures to explain himself that blew people's categories. Yeah, and this was one of them. Yeah, yeah. So I agree with you, Ben. It's a very odd story, but it has a surprising uh, connection to Jesus that he thought the story was significant. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. You guys have good questions. Aurelia, you asked a cool question that I think um, opens up a, a cool idea about the book of Numbers. Aurelia D. You Already asked done a good first. question before. Yeah. Um, you ask, are you guys able to shed some light on the book of the wars of the Lord, mentioned mm. in Numbers chapter 21. Is this a book that was considered part of the Hebrew canon? So uh, if you're not familiar, this is in a story right here in the travel section. And uh, it's a story of one of the battles that Israel fights as it starts to encounter um, Canaanite people groups. And then uh, there's a line in the story about where they're traveling, and then it says, as it says in the book of the wars of the Lord. Um, so the author of the Pentateuch has incorporated material from a source mm -hmm. here that he names. Which we don't have. Fascinating. Yeah. The book of the wars of the Lord is mentioned in a couple other places. It's mentioned once in the book of Joshua. Off the top of my head, I know Joshua I think it's mentioned somewhere in one of the books of Samuel, but I forget. So, yes, so, so here's what it opens up for us, that um, Moses uh, certainly played a role in the production of the literary production of the Torah. He's mentioned as writing uh, numerous times in the Torah. However, Moses only is born in the story of the Torah by the time you're already 52 chapters into the Torah. Right. So already we're talking about a whole bunch of material that Moses may have framed or composed, but he's not responsible for it. Right. Which then opens up the question that the Torah is, is much... Don't think of the Torah as a document that somebody sat down and wrote. Think of the Torah as a, a museum exhibit hmm. that someone has architected and collected materials from different places and different times and different sources and then arranged it as a meaningful experience for you to walk through. And one of the things they had access to was the Word of the Lord. One of them, one of these sources is called the Book and of the Lord. And we also know that another source potentially was when, when Moses wrote down all of the covenant right. commandments, yep. put it in the Ark of the Covenant. That's right. That was something that's right. that we don't another have. Source. That's right. Um, but that was a source. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And there are numerous um, other clues within the Torah itself that Moses wasn't the only contributor to, to the Torah. There's um, the best example, it's in a place you'd never expect it. In the Genesis, there's a genealogy of Esau in Genesis 36. And it says, here's a list of Edomite kings. This was before any of the kings of Israel reigned in the land. So, the, I mean, the genealogy straight up tells you it comes from a time way after Moses. Because they know they had kings. Because it's assuming that it's a time when the kings of Israel have been around for a long time. Right. 
So when uh, the prophets look back to the Torah, they viewed Moses as a key author. They didn't view Moses as the only author, though. In Daniel chapter 9 and Zechariah chapter 7, they view the Torah as coming from, just they say, Moses and the prophets. Yeah. So, um, the Book of the Wars of the Lord, it was, it was an archive hmm. document that documented uh, <coughs> Israel's journey through the wilderness. It was never a part of the Bible, but it was a source or some of the material that ended up in some of the books of the Bible. We, we do want to go into more depth on how the Bible was made. Yeah. I mean, this was a question about canon, and we could mm. talk for a long time about that. Yes. But, th but we, will, we want to make a series. We want to do something mm -hmm. with that. Yep. And um, so I think that will be really helpful. Yeah. It's been helpful for me, and I'm still in the thick of it trying to yeah. learn. And, yeah. Um, yeah, man, so, there's so much misinformation on... Netflix <laughs> or YouTube or whatever about the history of the making of the Bible. And it's really astounding because there is so much public, accessible information about where the Bible came from. Yeah. Um, and it bothers some people. If your assumption is the Bible dropped out of heaven, mm -hmm. then that history is going to, you know, might be troubling to you and have force you to rethink some things. But... Um, if you hold the historic view, orthodox view about the Bible, that it's a divine and human book, yeah. then we can trace much of that human history. And it's fascinating, I think. David anyway. Carlton, Charlton said the Bible being compiled is messy, and then people are messy. Yeah. And when God deals with us, he gets involved, and it's not clean. Yes. When he becomes human. Yeah, the story of Jesus is yeah. anything but simple right. or clean. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. But that's, yeah, that's right. Um, so, good question, Aurelia D. That's number two for Aurelia. She should win a prize. Yeah, that's right. It's Ben Brown. Oh, Ben Brown, you had a second question, but it was a good one. <laughs> and so, we're going to bring it up. Um, you, you ask, uh, in numbers, uh, what does it mean to bless? I'm thinking of the priestly blessing in numbers, and also the blessing cursing of Balaam, what happens when priests or people bless the people? So that's a, good, that's a great question. That really gets us into a core theme of the entire Torah, which is about God's desire to bless people. Because um, that idea appears on page one of the Bible. Yeah. When God makes humans and appoints them as his image bearers, the first thing God does to humans in the Bible is bless them. Um, so bless, we've talked about this before. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. It's one of these Bible religious words yeah, that you can say. we don't say. use, except when people sneeze. Yeah, or, yeah, bless you. Some people say, use it in the passive. I was Which, so, by the way, I you was know so why? blessed. Oh, that's true. But was, that's a Christian thing to say. Right, it's like Christianese. Christianese. Yeah. But what were you saying? Bless oh, you. Oh, just when you know where that comes from, is when you sneezed, it's, this might be total uh, urban, urban legend. Yes. But when you sneeze... People thought your soul was escaping, and so you say "bless you" to kind of get it back in. So when you say "bless you" to someone, you're trying to like stuff their soul back into their wow. mouth. Wow, I've, I've never heard that before. Yeah, Did I, you... might, I didn't just make it up, but it might not be true. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, it's in true. German? Dave's, Dave's nodding along. Dave is nodding. In German, you say "Gesundheit," good health. Gesundheit, mm -hmm. good health. Yeah. Well. Anyway, so blessing. Yeah, I feel oh, blessed. Okay. Blessing, yeah, which, yeah, yeah. Which, when you say I feel blessed, you just mean I feel hooked up. I feel like yeah, God's... Yeah, I, I got the hook up. Um, yeah. yeah. Things or, are going well. Or that, that really blessed me when you, like... It made me feel good. Yeah, it made the warm fuzzies. Warm fuzzies. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's interesting. So, yeah, the, yeah, the Bible is... Or, one, like, one our... Um, if you're going to give someone money or something, it's I like, really this is a blessing. It. Okay, so then... All right, now we're more in the ballpark okay. here. Okay. Yeah, so... Here's a 20. I hope that's a blessing. So, so God blesses the humans in, in the form of giving them uh, a world to be responsible for. And um, what he tells them is to be fruitful and multiply, you know, to rule the earth and subdue it and harness its resources and make it go somewhere. So blessing has to do with the, the gift that God gives to people uh, so it's often connected with ab abundance. So in the book of Genesis, uh, at the end of the book, 
Jacob predicts blessings on the tribe of Joseph, and it's like blessings in your barn and in your family and on your animals. So it's a sign of abundance. Then it becomes a way for you to bless someone, to pray a blessing, like in the book of Numbers, what the priests do is they pray a blessing. And it's a famous blessing. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he show you favor. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. So there, what you are praying for is that God would show this person favor by giving them peace, harmony, and abundance in their lives. So, so blessing, it's the hookups. It is the hookups. It's the, it's the divine hookups. And then that word then comes into early Christianity, and then it becomes one of the main vocabulary items that like Paul will use, for example, to describe the hookups uh, that come when Jesus. you put your trust and devotion in Jesus the Messiah. So his opening line in Ephesians is, praise be to the God through, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the Messiah. He's making it, he's spiritualizing it, where blessing was typically, oh, right, right, right. my harvest is awesome, Correct. lots yep. of children. Yeah, yeah. for Paul, it's uh, the presence of Jesus by means of his spirit. You're being included in the covenant family of God's people, which is multi-ethnic, international yeah. Jesus movement. It's and, getting good things. Yeah, totally. But Whether it, it's physical but, things yeah, or that's spiritual right. things. But for Paul, it's not just spiritual. It's, he, it's your life gets now rooted and transplanted into a new family, a mm. local community of people mm. who will, they're going to be your people. And, and, and Paul's vision of the church, it's your new family yeah. where you're taken care of and you learn how to be a new and different kind of human yeah. that's experiencing God's blessing. So it's a really profound way of actually telling the story of the whole Bible is blessing and curse. Blessing, loss of blessing, and then restoring the blessing. We should probably do a theme video on blessing now that I'm talking out loud about it. All right, yeah. Let's make, make a note. Blessing theme video. Make a note. Some, sometimes this is about how we come up with theme video ideas as we're talking, and we're like, oh, we should add that to the list. And we'll talk about how people sneeze out their soul. That's right. <laughs> yeah, totally. Let's, or maybe let's not. make a video about that one. Um, let's see. Uh, David Charlton, you're from the UK, regular. Um, there's a, a, a well-known story in Numbers about Moses um, that is kind of intense. Lots of people usually have questions about it. Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense at first glance. So um, right like here, it's, it's in chapter 20, part of the culmination of Israel's rebellion in the wilderness. Uh, Moses has a moment of failing. Um, so essentially what it is, is God, the people grumble. They're thirsty. This story's right. We even drew it and featured it right here. They're thirsty and they rebel. God tells Moses to uh, speak to a rock that the water would stream out of it and come, come to the people. And what Moses um, says is he doesn't speak to the rock. He strikes it. And then what he says to the people is, you rebels, must we, that is Aaron and I, bring water out of this rock for you? And then he hits the rock tw twice, we're told. And water comes out. And then immediately God says, Moses, you dishonored me. You didn't trust me. You I'll, didn't, I'll you zoom into the, the area. Yeah. You didn't, God says, you didn't trust me. You didn't believe in me. Therefore, you've dishonored me in the eyes of the people. So Moses, you will suffer the same fate as the Exodus generation, and you don't get to enter the Promised Land. And David Charlton, you ask, it seems harsh. <laughs> My question is about the rebellion of Moses. His decision to tap the rock rather than speak to it, is that all there is to it? It seems very harsh. Yeah, because the explanation that some people have then is, uh, and I think I've heard from you, is, well, we, we can notice two things. One is God tells him to speak to the rock, and it said he hits it with a staff. Correct. Secondly, he takes credit mm -hmm. for it by saying we, mm -hmm. and that's why it's big and bold in our mm -hmm. thing. Yeah if, yeah, if that's it, I mean, he just made a couple mistakes, <laughs> right? It's yeah. kind of like, yeah, maybe totally. you should have had a dress rehearsal first so right. we didn't screw this up. Yeah. Stakes are pretty high to get in the promised land or not. So, I mean, so yeah, is it too harsh? But the other question for me is, is the Bible, when, it's, when, when the language is crafted mm. and 
are they being this specific? Like, are we reading too much into these things mm. with, like... Those little differences? Yeah, little differences. Like, yeah. or was that just kind of like... Yeah, because he has hit the rock before. There's a story about in Exodus uh, 16 and 17 where they're thirsty and so Moses hit the rock and brought water yeah. for them. So he's hit a rock before. Yeah, and it worked out water. fine. Yeah, right? Yeah. So that's, yeah. Well, so one, the language is crafted... And so those little differences in the story, they matter. They're not accidental. Okay. That Moses fulfills God's command, but in a way that's not exactly the way that God commanded him to. And this connects to a motif throughout the whole of the Torah where you have characters, um, especially in the Abraham stories, where Abraham will do something God asked him to do, but slightly differently. And then it ends up in ruin and disaster. So he says, leave your father's household, but he takes his nephew with him, Lot. And then Lot becomes this huge source of headache and a huge pain and causes all these problems in Abraham. It's, it's huge. So my point is that the story's already prepared us for when people don't obey God exactly what he said, things don't yeah. go well. So is that the moral of the story? God tells you to do something, <laughs> do it exactly. I think that's a, one part of what's going on here. Okay. The other part is the fact that the narrator doesn't ever come and say, and here's why Moses was disqualified to go into the promised land. The narrator has chosen to leave it ambiguous, okay. which means that there is, the, the, the story leaves you puzzled and it leaves you much in the position of Moses himself, you know, of w wondering why this happened. And the way God evaluates it is not by pointing to a specific behavior. He says, you didn't have faith. You didn't believe in me. And, and in that little line, you didn't have faith or believe in me, Moses' behavior is mirroring what the Israelites did when they rejected going into the promised land. Because God's evaluation of the Israelites was, you didn't have faith and you didn't believe in me. So Moses' behavior is being paired with Israel's rebellion. And that's the connection that the story wants to make. So there are lots of stories like this in the Torah. But it's just like Balaam, where they raise questions that we have that the story ultimately doesn't answer. Where's the part where ev everyone else has doesn't get to go into the promised land. It's numbers 13 and 14. So the spies come back. Here's all the people. And they're like, let's go back to Egypt. They want to yeah. go back to Egypt. And he's like, all right. And yeah. So, and so cool. God, Your children will go in. Yep. God disqualifies a whole generation. Um, and in Numbers 14, God describes it. He sums it up as an act of So this kind of, is there supposed to be a, a parallel yes. in a way? Yeah. The author of the Torah has paralleled Moses' rebellion with Israel's rebellion by that key word, unbelief, or mm. lack of faith. Okay. Which connects back, again, this is a big theme in the Torah, because it connects all the way back to the Abraham stories, mm. where God brought Abraham out in the middle of the night to look up at the stars, and Abraham's asking, like, I don't have any kids, how am I ever going to become a nation? And God says, yeah, look at the stars, and if you can count them, that's how many kid, you know, children and grandchildren you're going to have. And we're told that Abraham believed in God. It's a rare word in the Torah, but when it occurs, it's very important. Hmm. So Abraham had every opportunity not to believe. And by believe, we just mean he trusted. trusted. He trusted God. He's like, okay, that's what you say. He trusted that's God's promise. Happen. That's right. And, and, so, and so he is contrasted in the Torah with the generation that experienced the Exodus, and they don't trust. And Moses, who was the... He was God's instrument in bringing about the Exodus, and even he didn't trust. So the Torah is a large-scale contrast between Abraham and Moses and Israel, and hmm. these portraits of faith and lack of faith. Hmm. Um, so the Moses story is really important. There's a, there is still a mystery as to what exactly was, went on in his heart that God nailed him for. Right. But the, but the narrator is connecting him to a much larger theme in the Torah about faith and trust in God. Yeah. Which is why Paul the Apostle made such a big deal about the faith, the trust in God theme in the Torah. Hmm. Uh, in his letters to the Romans and Galatians, he was paying attention to, to that motif. To this motif. Yeah. It's cool. Um, which anyway. is kind of a theme. I'm going to write that one down. So. Yeah. What's that? Faith? Trust? Yeah. Faith. Yeah. Belief. 
Be trust. Trust. Belief. Faith. Yeah, the pro we, we, don't, have a, we don't really have that one, do we? We have a problem in English. We have too many words for this. We have faith as the noun. Okay. You can say, I have faith. I have faith. Then we have belief. And we Which have you only say about spiritual things. You don't say, like, I have faith in this chair. Oh, that's true. Or I have faith in... No, I guess you I say... have faith like, in you. You have faith okay, in Okay, you have faith in people. Which means you're trustworthy. But you're having faith in a relational kind of abstract yeah. thing. Yeah. You don't have faith in, like, concrete yeah. things. Yeah, faith tends to, yeah, refer to religious beliefs. Or you're and, a person of faith. And, and interrelational things. Or and re character. Character stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't have... You don't have faith going over a bridge that the bridge is going to not collapse. You just have trust. Yeah, you tr I trust the bridge. That's, the tr that's what trust is. We use the word trust for that. Yeah, it's complicated. And in Hebrew, it's very simple. There's just there's one word at the base of all of our various what words. What is the Hebrew there's word? One word. Do you have to clear oh, your throat to say uh, No. Amen. 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 It's the root of our word amen. Really? Yes. Just amen. Amen. Yeah, it's ad amen as an adjective that means trustworthy. Trustworthy. True. And why do you say at the end of a prayer? True. True that. True that. I think that's what it means. <laughs> Amen. True that. Wow. Yeah, I need a theme video on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Andy Gray, you asked a question. I would like a discussion on the difference between being ceremonially unclean and being sinful. What implication or direction can we learn from this today? So this is related to Leviticus also, but... Right here in the early part of the book, there's all these things about ritual purity and cleanness and yeah. uncleanness. Watch the holiness video. The holiness video answers That'll help it. you. Yeah. So basically, you become ritually impure or unclean if you're an Israelite through just a handful of things. It's either contact with dead bodies, diseased, or reproductive fluids. So these are, this is a, a symbolic set of customs in Israel where if you touch one of these, you can't go into God's presence. That's what it means to be unclean. Um, it doesn't mean that you're sinful and a horrible person. You do something wrong. It just means you're marked with these symbols of, of death. Yeah. And so you can't have those symbols connected to you and go into the presence of the author of all life. That, that's wrong to cross that boundary line, but being ritually impure is, is not inherently sinful. Um, I think maybe I heard you say once, it's kind of like, maybe this was you, I don't remember. But it's like, if you're going to meet the President of the United States, you might take a bath first. <laughs> yeah, that's a I good don't point. Know yeah. that's... Or you wouldn't wear, like, your, gar your gardening, like, pr clothes. Or the clothes that are, like, your project work clothes, you wouldn't wear those. You yeah. would wear, like, something holy, which is, like, unique. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, something like that. Okay. So, um, ritual impurity was a whole set of practices uh, that the Israelites were to practice. But, and but you're going to touch dead people, which is going to happen. Yes. You're yeah. going to do you're gonna, all these things, and um, it doesn't mean you did something wrong. It just means you've got to chill out for a while Correct. and not go to the temple. Correct. So the only carryover we see of that into the New Testament is the language of purity gets then put as a map onto... Um, moral, what we would call moral purity. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you'll find pure or impure, clean or unclean language, not in the New Testament, in Jesus or Paul, a tie, connect, but connected to matters of like sex and, you know, what you do with your money and greed and so on. And they'll use the words impurity to describe this. So there, they are using this language, mapping it onto there are certain ways of behaving as a human, where you are associating yourself with death and destruction. And that's not good. So, I think, so, it's, so in the same way yes. that you would touch this dead body, mm -hmm. be unclean, can't go to the temple, mm -hmm. now he's using that mm -hmm. as a structure to say, cool, now that you understand that, because you've, you've been doing that for a while, yeah. you get that, yeah. we don't get that, but they got that. Yeah. Now in the same way, realize that when you are sexually impure, you are now in a space yeah, where you shouldn't be like... Yeah, that's right. If you're sleeping around, if you say you're a follower of Jesus and you're sleeping around, Paul would say that's... There's, a, there's just as so much of a problem going on. That's right. On. Yeah, you're acting impure and you are, are acting unclean. You're associating yourself with a death-dealing, destructive behavior. And Jesus died to clean you from that. 
So anyway. I think what's tough is he's using. He uses it. Paul uses the la the clean and unclean language about morality. Yes. Ethical he's using decision. a practice that we're not familiar with. That's right. That's really hard for us to comprehend. Totally. As a stage yeah. Yeah. to talk about something we do understand. Correct. And it's yeah. just confusing. That's why we associate being impure with sinful, because that's the way Paul uses the language. I see. That's not the way the language is used in Leviticus and Numbers. Isn't that interesting? Okay, I think I get it. Yeah. All right. All right, guys. Have a great week. Thanks, Thanks for, for supporting the Bible Project. You guys are awesome. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Bible Project. We're a nonprofit studio in Portland, Oregon, and we have lots of free resources on our website, thebibleproject.com. Thanks for being a part of this with us.